Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a long and different Ancient DOS Games video than usual, since today we're taking a look at the Pinball Gold Pack, a compilation of not one, not two, but five different pinball programs all published by the same company, each of which has four pinball tables to choose from, resulting in a grand total of 20 pinball tables to play in the entire package. Now naturally, this begs the question, are they actually any good? And this is where I have to step up on my soapbox, take a deep breath, and say, almost. So here's the thing. This package is made up of the tables from Pinball Dreams, Pinball Dreams 2, Pinball Fantasies, Pinball Mania, and Pinball Illusions, almost all of which originally came out on the Amiga, with Dreams 2 being the only one which is DOS exclusive, as far as I can tell. And quite frankly, the aesthetics and designs of the tables on offer are really impressive. At least, the ones attached to Digital Illusions. But some of those tables feel like they could have been real pins at some point, unlike what's on offer in most other pinball software at the time, which doesn't feel connected to real pinball in the slightest. The overarching problem with every program in this package, though, is the physics, which is weird because the physics are in this incredibly awkward state of doing some things more accurately than even some modern pinball software, while doing some things so incredibly inaccurately that it makes some of the tables borderline impossible to play, especially if you increase the table angle beyond a low setting. Not to mention, because there's technically five different pieces of software involved here, the physics are not identical between them all. Uh, there's similarities for sure, but specific programs in this package have more egregious physics issues which don't show up in the rest, and I'll be pointing those out as we come up to them. So in order to streamline this video better, we're going to do one overall game stats section for the gold pack as a whole, then we'll be taking a look at each program individually in chronological order from first release to last released. I also want to quickly point out that these games run in some very weird display resolutions, but were clearly meant to have a 1 to 1 pixel aspect ratio no matter what mode they're in, with the end user simply adjusting the horizontal width on their CRT screens when they wanted to play. This is kind of a problem playing these on modern systems through emulation, as I couldn't find a way to compensate for this with DOSBox or DOSBox ECE, and DOSBox X won't even recognize GOG's CD image format for these games for some peculiar reason. And one last thing I should point out is that I'm aware some people out there have been making efforts to redo and re-release better versions of some of the software included in this package. For instance, Dreams 2 never got an Amiga port, yet an unofficial port of Dreams 2 to the Amiga was released just last year at the start of 2023, and touts improved physics and other enhancements over the original. This video is commentary on the gold pack as it is, when purchased as its original release or off of digital storefronts presently. The Pinball Gold Pack was put out by 21st Century Entertainment in 1996 and is a compilation of their five pinball releases between 1992 and 1995, with Digital Illusions being responsible for three out of the four original Amiga games, Spidersoft handling the porting or design of three of the DOS games, and Frontline Design handling the porting of the other two DOS titles. And I'll point out which ones are which as we get to the games themselves. Also of note is that every program in the package supports having between 1 and 8 players taking turns, which is kind of ridiculous and very atypical of real pinball, with most real pinball machines topping out at 4 players, though I am very aware that there are some real pins out there with atypical player limits. In terms of video, each game in the package supports standard VGA, but each also has support for a non-standard VGA mode of some flavor to offer quote, high resolution gameplay with the highest resolution possible in certain programs being 336 by 350 which no that is nowhere close to a standard VGA resolution and looks very wrong unless you adjust your CRT's horizontal width when you start playing as the graphics across the entire program are meant to be viewed with square pixels in the high res modes the Pinball Dreams package, though, contains a special history section which uses 640x480 256 color SVGA graphics, though with incredibly bit crushed images which don't look as high res as they actually are. Now, as for audio, I've listed the audio support most of the programs have, though you get fewer with the earlier releases and more with the later releases, but these devices are the most common ones supported. 
As for its current release state, the Pinball Gold Pack is still commercial and can be obtained digitally on GOG for $10, or if you want a physical copy, they're not too hard to find, though you won't find a huge selection of copies at any one point in time. But they don't run that much when you do find them, with the CD alone typically going for between $5 and $10, and fully boxed that's closer to $20. One thing you have to be careful of though is that there are other releases out there which call themselves Pinball Gold, which have absolutely nothing to do with this Pinball Gold pack. So make sure you're seeing actual shots of the CD or box when searching this out to ensure that you're getting what you want. Also, be aware that if you want the Amiga releases of these games, they were never bundled together in a single package like this. Although there was an Amiga release which bundled both dreams and fantasies together. Before we cover each program individually, I do want to go over some general things to expect between all five programs. Most of them have the ability to change various game settings, such as the number of balls per game, the table angle, and the controls, of which there's only four. Left flipper, right flipper, forward nudge, referred to in these games as either pushing or tilting the table, and a button to launch the ball or pull back on the plunger. Unfortunately, there are no sideways nudges, which kind of sucks, but really it's not that surprising. You use the escape key to quit, the P key to pause, and the F1 through F8 keys to select how many players will be playing. Now, some of the games also support typing in your initials into the high scores table directly, while some force you to use the flippers to scroll through letters and select letters with the nudge key. As for the physics, one of the key things you're going to notice before too long is that the ball can end up doing some weird things in all five programs, and this is because one aspect of real physics these games are trying to emulate, which many pinball games fail to emulate, is ball spin. Now I've mentioned before how certain tricks you can do on real pinball machines fail to function in digital simulations when ball spin isn't a factor, and sure enough, I was extremely surprised when I tried doing drop catches on live catches in these games and found out you can actually pull these moves off. The timing is incredibly tight of course, just like on the real thing, but the fact that these tricks can be done at all is kinda crazy to see in digital pinball software this old. However, one of the most important tricks in being able to control where you flip from, the post transfer, is virtually impossible to perform on every table in these games because the slingshots are often tucked back very far from the flippers, and because the flipper physics are handled in a very weird way, whereby the closer to the base of the flipper the ball is, the less power it gets when you send it up the field. Unlike on a real pinball machine where even the base of the flipper can impart an impressive amount of force into the ball. Instead, I found the most reliable trick for getting the ball onto the other flipper to be alley passes. This is where you let the ball roll down the flipper and flip just as the ball is leaving the flipper so that it goes almost straight sideways and thus gets sent right up the alley on the opposite side. And tap passes are also possible since, if you tap the flipper button very briefly, these programs will successfully emulate the flipper only delivering part of its power instead of all of its power. But I found it incredibly difficult to get the timing for this just right and only managed to pull off tap passes a couple times. The biggest issue with the physics though are the flippers themselves. On a real pinball machine, backhand shots are actually really hard to perform. They're virtually impossible to do if the ball is starting off from a cradle position on the flipper, requiring the ball to roll up the flipper as you're holding the flipper up, then releasing and repressing the flipper button to slam the ball up and sideways into a backhand. Normally, if you flip a flipper while the ball is near the base, it'll go straight up, and the closer to the tip, the more of an angle you'll get. Here in all five of these pinball programs, the ball won't even budge if you try to flip it from the base of the flipper, and once the ball is halfway down the flipper, a proper flip will cause the ball to perform a sharp backhand. But to actually aim down the middle or towards the opposite edge of the table, the ball has to be incredibly close to the tip of the flipper, to the point where the accuracy required to make some shots is insanely precise, when in reality it shouldn't be that precise. Worse still, the flippers are just underpowered in general. Like, they don't feel like they have anywhere near as much force as they should have, with it being even worse in the two programs designed entirely by Spidersoft, to the point where if you set the table angle in those programs any higher than the lowest setting, it actually becomes impossible to make certain shots. So yeah, the physics are just in this very weird in-between state where the ball itself behaves more like it should compared to other digital pinball programs, but the flippers are just plain terrible. Not to mention, I was able to get some really weird things to happen with these physics, which... You know, actually, I'd be lying if I said I never saw things like this happen in real pinball either, so the fact that this kind of stuff happens here 
It is actually surprisingly genuine. One thing that's not genuine, however, is nudging. Now, even though you only get a forwards nudge and no sideways nudges, the strength of the nudges you can perform is absurd. In fact, your forward nudges are so strong that you can actually perform death saves, as in nudging the ball off the skirt at the bottom of the play field, back above the flippers and into normal play. The timing is a little tricky, but it can be done with some regularity in these games, and I need to emphasize right now, do not attempt to do this on a real pinball machine. It's a highly illegal maneuver in all competitive pinball due to the sheer amount of force it takes to get this to happen, which can end up breaking your hands, damaging the machine, or both. I mean, sure, if it's your own pin, you understand the risks, and you know exactly how to do the move so as not to split your hand bones in half, then go for it. But for everyone else, leave death saves for the digital stuff with inaccurate physics where you can get the force of a falcon punch just by gently pressing spacebar. Anyways, that's enough about the generalizations, let's get to the actual tables themselves. First up is Pinball Dreams, originally developed by Digital Illusions and ported to DOS by Spidersoft in 1993. Now, the interface in the gold pack combines Dreams and Dreams 2 into a single front end, which includes the ability to look up details of real pinball machines in a history section. Now, this isn't anywhere close to a comprehensive list and seems to more so be focused on games which are popular, plus the flyer photos are incredibly badly bit crushed, making them surprisingly hard to make out any details on. But it does let you look up games by name, year, lead designer, or manufacturer. So that's a nice touch, even if for the most part you're completely unable to really see the playfields of these games. The four tables which make up the original Pinball Dreams are Ignition, Steel Wheel, Beatbox, and Nightmare, all of which feature a 16-segment display strip for showing gameplay details as you're playing, which is the typical display format of late 80s pins and a handful of early 90s pins. Though it's a surprisingly short-lived run in the world of pinball, with most everything solid state before only having seven segment displays to show score, and everything following using DMDs or dot matrix displays. Ignition is a pretty basic space-themed game meant to invoke the simplicity you would find in space-themed pins from the late 70s and 80s, except the two primary shots need to make are as far left and as far right as they could possibly be, making them extremely hard to hit with the kind of physics going on here. Thus, you tend to spend most of the game just hitting the targets and bumpers. You'll also notice the center post between the flippers. Every table in the first four programs in this five program pack have center posts, and given how strong the nudges are, you would be wise to learn how to use that post to save the ball when you can. Next up is Steel Wheel, which is definitely one of the easier tables of the Dreams program as it has nice wide shots to make, with a couple exceptions, and also has some semblance of progression, which most of the tables here do not. The theme is that of running a train service in Wild West times, and doesn't really remind me of any real pins, though the design has a heavy focus on reusing the same shots for multiple features, all of which have two-letter designations. Uh, this might be a good time to point out that in terms of gameplay features, there's hardly any variety in these initial programs. Heck, there isn't even any multi-ball of any kind, instead placing a strong emphasis on bonus multipliers, holding bonuses, and doubling bonuses. Next is Beatbox, which I feel is the most creative table in this initial set of four. Though realistically speaking, it has a lot of wasted space, with the upper part of the playfield mostly being completely hidden away under a massive overhang. This would be a good time to point out, one of the inaccuracies in the physics is that height is not tracked properly in terms of ball motion. If the ball experiences what should be a sudden change in height, such as being deposited into an inlane over a habit trail, the wire rails elevated above the playfield, it just keeps moving at full speed instead of losing momentum due to having to drop straight down. This eventually gets addressed and I will point out when it's finally fixed. Last in the original Dreams release is Nightmare, which feels distinctly inspired by the real Terminator 2 Judgment Day pinball machine in terms of its layout but plays way worse. In fact, this is definitely the weakest playing pin of the initial four, especially considering the set of targets facing diagonally up, which doesn't make any sense at all, since you can never intentionally aim for them. Unlike the original Pinball Dreams, Pinball Dreams 2 was developed entirely by Spidersoft without any involvement from Digital Illusions, plus was made exclusively for DOS, being released in 1994. 
I'm not entirely certain why this never made it onto the Amiga, but if anyone happens to know the answer to that, then feel free to post those details in the comments section. The four tables for this pack are Neptune, Safari, Revenge of the Robot Warriors, and Stalterm. First up is Neptune, and this table immediately demonstrates why Spidersoft was not good at making digital pinball on their own without any guidance, as this table is blatantly taking after the Deep Sea table found in Epic Pinball, only it hasn't been done anywhere near as well. That upper left ramp leading to the long habit trail going down the left side of the machine is so high up the machine that, given the physics on offer, if you have your table angle set anywhere higher than the lowest setting, it'll be pretty much impossible to get the ball up there. In fact, this is one of the worst designed tables in the entire Pinball Gold package since it only has three major shots to go for and the rest are just drop targets. Next up is Safari, based on the idea of going on a photo safari, taking pictures of various wild animals. Now, this one's a bit unusual in its design, and kind of feels a little cramped given that the entire back tenth of the playfield is dedicated to a ramp which rolls down sideways to drop the ball into a hole for spinning a random reward. While the layout is creative for sure, it doesn't feel like something that should work well if it tried to do it with a physical pinball machine. Next is Revenge of the Robot Warriors, which, besides having a very bizarre name, is probably the best table in this set of four, as there's six major shots to go for, all of which are clearly indicated, three of which deposit the ball into the upper section of the playfield to give you a chance of raising your bonus multiplier. This is also the first table to show us something very curious, which proves that there were some shenanigans going on, either at Spidersoft or 21st Century. And to explain what I mean, let's pause the visual action right here. See this round habit trail section here? This looks as though the intent was to create a sort of funnel for the ball to spin around in, then leave in one of three ways. But as we've already established, these games don't handle the height of the ball in any meaningful way. Thus this effect couldn't be implemented, and this section up here just acts like a flat surface when the ball is on it. Even though it definitely looks like it was supposed to be more dynamic than that, and I have to wonder who ultimately made the decision not to elaborate on it. Last in the Dreams 2 pack is Stall Turn, based on the theme of stunt flying. And this one's kinda neat, but also kinda aggravating, because all of the shots are packed in really tight, thus it's hard to make any of them in the first place, let alone make them often enough to make meaningful progress. That said, the layout feels both creative and feels like something you could find in a proper physical pinball machine. So if there's any in this set of four I think would benefit the most from a digital to physical transition, it'd be this one. The DOS version of Pinball Fantasies also came out in 1994, having been originally developed by Digital Illusions, but instead of having Spidersoft do the port, it was handled by Frontline Design, and as such, there's an immediate difference in feel, as the flippers actually feel like they have a proper amount of strength to them. I mean, they still don't aim correctly, but if you know when to hit the button, the ball's more likely going to make it the entire distance instead of falling short. There's also a very curious thing I noticed, which kind of proves something interesting about the physics, which I'll point out in a moment. The four tables on offer here are Partyland, Speed Devils, Billion Dollar Game Show, and Stones and Bones. First up is Partyland, which is carnival themed and blatantly inspired by a real pinball machine known as Funhouse, just without a scary mechanical face watching where your ball's going with its eyes. And heck, there's even a hidden spot the ball can fall into if it doesn't make it completely around the upper loop, just like in Funhouse. And the first thing you're going to notice is that we have a DMD now instead of a 16 segment display, but you're also going to notice that the habit trails don't just drop the ball back onto the playfield with full momentum, just like on a real pin, except the reason it's not doing that has nothing to do with the physics accuracy. If you look closely, you'll notice the habit trails are intentionally moving the ball horizontally right before dropping it into a vertical inlay, meaning all that momentum is getting cancelled out. Now, briefly skipping ahead a little, I can prove that one of these tables has a vertical drop out of a habit trail, and when it happens, the ball still keeps its momentum. Given what we're seeing here, it suggests that the lack of proper height tracking in the physics is a core aspect of the original physics by Digital Illusions, and not something Spidersoft or Frontline screwed up, since most of these tables were designed to mitigate this failing. 
Anyways, party lands a decent table for the most part, but hitting the right loop shot is incredibly difficult because of how tight it is, combined with the pop bumpers being in the way. Though I'm not sure I would have used the letters P, U, K, and E on the top lanes for awarding multipliers, as that might be giving the wrong impression. Next up is Speed Devils, featuring a cross-country racing theme. It's kinda blah, really. There's only four major shots on the main playfield, and the upper playfield area with the extra flipper isn't really used to great effect, other than to rack up multipliers faster. Now, there's a lot of wasted space on this table, and I feel the main issue with it are the game rules as opposed to the layout of the table, as surprisingly little happens unless you hit very specific shots at very specific times. As you've all probably noticed by now, the game rules for these tables really haven't been getting that complex yet, and while some tables have a feature or two thrown in which the others don't have, they've mostly just all had the same features. Next up is Billion Dollar Game Show, and while I think the theme and rule set of this game are both fine, it's probably the most boring table in the entire Pinball Gold Pack because there's very few major shots on this table to begin with, and heck, there's hardly any minor shots either. This table definitely could have used some reworking to add more shots and make the flow more dynamic, since as it stands, there's just too little to do to keep it interesting. And the last table in the Fantasies pack is Stones and Bones, featuring one of the more imaginative themes in the whole of the entire Pinball Gold pack, that of a haunted tower, and is also one of the best playing tables on offer, as each major shot is clearly marked, all but one of them is wide enough that you don't have to be extra precise to hit them, and the rule set has a lot going on, along with featuring a special elevated section on the left side for the ball to fall down, as well as a kickback on the left out lane. This table definitely got the most attention out of all four of the Fantasies tables, and it shows, as I would consider it the best playing table across the entirety of the first four programs in the Pinball Gold Pack. And I'm even a fan of spooky horror themes. I can appreciate a solidly designed pinball table regardless of the theme it's presenting. I just wish the flippers were more accurate. Oh boy, now we come up to Pinball Mania, with this one once again being developed entirely by Spidersoft, being released in 1995. And this... this is bad. The four tables on offer here are Tarantula, Jailbreak, Kickoff, and Jackpot, all of which have terrible designs and a physics problem unique only to the Mania tables. I'll discuss the unique problem when we get to Jailbreak, but since we're starting with Tarantula, I need to give an arachnophobia warning, since just the playfield art alone may cause problems for some of the most sensitive people watching. I'll let you know when you can open your eyes, or you can just skip ahead with the YouTube chapter thingy, but for everyone else watching, we're switching over in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So the first table in this pack, Tarantula, perfectly exemplifies how bad Spidersoft was at making digital pinball feel like real pinball. The irony being, everything which happens on the DMD feels pretty close to what you might get on a real DMD, but the actual layout of this table is just plain dumb. There's only two major shots, with two additional shots being delegated to a side flipper, which has only a single means of delivering the ball to it properly without having already made a shot with the side flipper. Furthermore, because of how weak the flippers are, it's practically impossible to get the ball into the mini playfield area in the top left. And the worst part of saying all that is that this is actually the second best table in the Mania pack. Yeah. Anyways, clearing to a black screen temporarily, spiders are gone. If you were looking away or had your eyes closed, you can look back now. So let's move on to the next table, Jailbreak. While the layout is kind of interesting, it doesn't really give the primary flippers much to do, with more emphasis placed on making shots with the flippers in the middle of the playfield, which have had their left and right controls swapped. The left flipper in the middle is flipped with the right button, and the right flipper with the left. I mean, I know why they did it, but it goes against the logic used virtually every real pinball machine which has flippers above the bottom of the playfield. Also, I can use this table to demonstrate the physics problem which is unique to the Mania Pack. Whenever a ball rolls down an in-lane, for some peculiar reason it accelerates extremely quickly, so much so that you'll never be ready for it half the time, even when you know what's going to happen. Now, this happens on all four tables in this pack, but I decided to show it here because I really don't have much else to say about Jailbreak. 
Actually, I don't have much to say about the next table either, Kickoff. This one's got a soccer theme, and looks like it might actually be interesting, except for one tiny little problem, which isn't going to be obvious unless I state it outright. That circular spot in the middle of the playfield art, which looks like a ball, yeah, that's not playfield art, that's a solid lump of plastic smack dab right in the path of the center playfield goal shot, which is literally impossible to hit because of that thing. Placing permanent obstacles in the path of shots you have to make on a pinball table is just plain dumb, and as such, I would quantify this table as the worst playing table in the whole of the entire pinball gold pack. I mean, yeah, I know, I've focused on a lot of negatives so far, but that's just because I know what's coming. But before we get there, the final table in the Mania Pack is Jackpot, which still isn't good, but it's the best of the four in this quartet. The main problem here is again a lack of stuff to do with the main flippers, with most of the scoring delegated to the upper flippers, though at least their positions and usage are straightforward. In fact, that's what I would say makes this table the best in the Mania Pack, is the fact that it's incredibly straightforward and isn't trying to do anything super tricky. And lastly, we come up to Pinball Illusions, which was developed by Digital Illusions and ported by Frontline Design, not Spidersoft, in 1995. And it's a good thing too, because short of the flipper accuracy still being garbage, there was some serious passion put into this set of four tables. Law and Justice, Babe Watch, Extreme Sports, and The Vikings. Though that said, the menu program has received a notable downgrade, allowing you to look up table info and high scores, but no longer allowing you to adjust table settings like ball counts or slope height. Now, as we get into the first table in the set, Law and Justice, you're going to immediately notice that these tables look and feel way closer to actual pinball machines than any we have seen up to this point. The layouts make sense, the shots make sense, there's actual, real features to these tables now, so many that I don't even know where to begin. Well, let's get one thing out of the way. Remember how every table up to now was a single ball affair? Yeah, all four tables here have multi-ball, though it's called M-ball because, as I pointed out before, multi-ball was a trademarked term. Now, there's different kinds of multi-balls too, and all four tables also have a way of starting a non-mode-based multi-ball without too much difficulty, which gets more difficult the more times you try to activate it, which again is just like how it is on real pinball machines from the 90s. Oh yeah, and that's another thing, we have actual modes now. In pinball terms, a mode is when the rules temporarily change for a limited time to focus on making certain shots to score a lot more points than you normally would, often with some sort of theme to the mode. Once the mode ends, you go back to normal play. Now, all four tables here require you to make a certain shot first to enable the ability to start a mode, then a shot which actually starts the selected mode, while making a skill shot at the start of a ball automatically enables the ability to start a mode. I should also quickly mention before I forget that none of these tables here in the illusions pack have a center post anymore, meaning it's much easier to lose the ball down the middle than in all of the prior games. Anyways, let's move on to the next table, Babe Watch, as I continue to explain some of the things going on here, although, um, I actually kinda don't understand the theme of Babe Watch. If it's supposed to be macho surfer dudes on a beach, then why is there a casino? I think in terms of themes, I find this one the most confusing out of the entire Pinball Gold Pack, since it doesn't seem very coherent, but the layout is surprisingly solid given how much of it is dedicated to the mini playfield area. In fact, now would be a good time to point out that height is finally being tracked properly in the physics. Thus, when a ball hits the end of a habit trail and is dropped back onto the playfield, it actually drops onto the playfield and loses its momentum, as opposed to keeping its momentum unrealistically. You're also going to notice blue flashers on every playfield, which lets you know where a ball is going to get released from after getting a ball into a shot which removes it from the playfield, which again is just like what you would expect on a real pinball machine. Next up is Extreme Sports. This is definitely the odd one out in terms of the layout of the playfield, and is probably the weakest playing table in the Illusions pack, but that still puts it miles ahead of most of the tables in the entirety of the pinball gold pack as a whole. Ironically though, it also means I have the least to say about this one, other than that it's surprisingly hard to hit that left ramp shot. Not the left loop shot, which is also a ramp, but the left ramp shot which is near the top of the playfield. The last table in the entire pinball gold pack though is probably one of the best ones too. The Vikings. 
And this one has a very unique layout to it, which actually makes sense in terms of how it plays and flows. The upper flipper actually has three shots it can make, one of which can also be made with the lower flipper, and there's a good variety of the modes. Plus, oh, wait, what the- there's video modes? Okay, so... In pinball terms, a video mode is when the action on the playfield pauses for a moment, drawing the player's attention to the DMD to use the flipper buttons to play a very simple minigame on the DMD itself. Uh, there's debate amongst pinball players as to whether video modes belong in pinball or not, but the fact that they put video modes into these purely digital pinball games back in the mid-90s is nothing short of astounding, and a true testament to how far digital illusions had come in translating the proper pinball experience onto a computer screen. Oh, heck, even Law and Justice has a video mode, though it's actually kind of hard to tell what you're doing in it. And I'm gonna guess the other two tables have video modes too, though I was never able to see them if they are indeed there. Back on the Vikings though, everything about this table and its design is near perfect. The main flippers have six major shots to aim for, there's multiple ways to get the ball loaded onto the upper flipper, the mode start shot is front and center right in the middle of the playfield, the pop bumpers are right below the multiplier lanes where they should be, and the music is catchy in one of the worst ways possible, which is kind of both a good and a bad thing, but whatever. The point is that this is the one and only table in the entire program which feels like it came from a real pinball machine, and if I had to choose only one to be translated over into reality, It'd be this one. Overall, the software found in the Pinball Gold Pack all do something which Epic Pinball and most other DOS pinball programs never did, and that's translate the aesthetics of real pinball onto a computer screen while paying more attention to the ball physics than would otherwise be expected, thus making it possible to do certain real-life tricks which are otherwise impossible to perform. However, the flipper accuracy is atrocious across the entire range of games, which is unfortunate because I feel if the flippers were tweaked to perform more like on a real pinball machine, these games would blow Epic Pinball clear out of the water. But because the flippers are the way they are, these pinball programs are actually much more frustrating than they really should be, especially for someone like myself who has a decent level of skill with the real thing. I guess my final verdict is, it's worth playing these if you get the chance, but unless you can easily adapt to off-kilter pinball physics, you'll probably get a lot more angry with these tables than you would with most other pinball software. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any way to get the visuals to render at the correct aspect ratio under any flavor of DOS box I threw at these games. What you've been seeing on screen is how they should look, not what I had to endure to play them. For now, the best thing to do is set a fixed cycles count of 20,000 and make sure aspect correction is turned on, since it'll look even worse if you turn aspect correction off. Beyond that, the only other thing I could recommend is playing full screen on a CRT monitor, whether with real 90s hardware or emulated on a modern PC, since that way you can adjust the horizontal width. Though, given the way the digital release on GOG handles the CDs, I'm not certain if that's possible to make that work right on real hardware or not. Anywho, that'll be all for today's somewhat lengthy episode of Ancient DOS Games. I've had my fill of digital pinball for now, so a couple Saturdays from now, on October 5th, for episode 333, we'll be reviewing a considerably different kind of game. One which was rare and expensive to acquire long before the speculator nonsense was been going on lately. And I was sent a boxed copy to show you all. A boxed copy which is mostly just red and white on the outside. Yeah, that game. Better make sure you stay tuned for this one because I never thought I'd be getting a chance to cover it properly. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to all the people seen here supporting me on Patreon. If you'd like to join in with them and support the show directly, head on over to patreon.com slash K-A-S-I-C-K. 